is the last unaltered Liberty ship uh, still in existence. And it's right here in San Francisco. Yeah, it's in Fort Mason. And we had a party there last Saturday, which was very uh, warm, uh, heartwarming and, and moving, really, because people responded with such warmth. Uh, a man came up to me, to me and said, I finally can show my sons what I did during the war. This book says it. And then the young people said, uh, I finally know what my father did during the war. Because there I weren't always people fighting on foreign soils. A lot of the people were pulling together on the home front. Yeah. And that's basically what the Liberty ships were about. Tell me, for those that don't know, I was there and I saw the Liberty ship, what the Liberty ships were. Well, the Liberty ship was a ship that was 10,500 tons. And it used to uh, take about a year to build them. And we built them in and uh, we reduced them more and more, and eventually we built them in 18 days instead of a year, and one ship as a sort of a stunt to find out how fast we really could do it. We did one 10,000 ton ship in four and a half days, and this is described in the last chapter of this book. Th that's truly amazing. Now, how was this done? Uh, because we didn't have the sort of uh, modern day equipment today that well, we have today, we didn't have it then. No. How did they build a 10,000 ton ship? Well, they, they built it the same way as Ford built his cars, uh, pre-assembly. The, 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 when you say a four and a half day ship, that means it took four and a half days from the time the keel was laid to the time the ship was launched. And this is the important time, because as long as you build a ship on a shipway, you cannot build another one. And it doesn't make any difference how long it takes to, uh, to build the parts which assemble it the ship. So we built these pieces all over the Richmond shipyard and then big cranes took them and put them into place and were welded together. And uh, what you could do is it's just like you build a house and you had, uh, you, you, you built the whole, the whole basement and then put it in place and then you built the whole first floor and built it in place and put the wall that was pre-assembled with all the windows and the windows silk and the the window frames and the flowers and the pots and everything in there and put it on and eventually drop the roof in one piece and the chimney perhaps in another piece and here is the house. And the boat. And the boat. And the ship. Oh, it was a ship. Uh, it was a ship. It's ship. very important. To yes. Um, one of the most fascinating things are the people who worked on these ships. Yeah. It was everyone from architects to housewives. Mm -hmm. That was fascinated me because I was new in the United States. I had arrived only a year before, and my language was very poor. My knowledge of Americans were non-existent, really. And here I got, within a few months, I got a real taste of what America at its best was like. And I learned the language and the customs right there in the shipyard. I think I learned more about the language and the customs in America than I learned about shipbuilding. The story Swing Shift is about all the different people, where they came from. Yeah. Um, it was one of the first times that men and women had worked together on such yeah. an equal footing. Uh, women were doing welding jobs right alongside of the men. Yeah, not only welding jobs, they, 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 they took jobs which required a 10-pound hammer. And uh, they were just as good as men. I didn't realize that it was the first time, but looking back now, I know that what we did in the shipyards, I don't know if, if we have approached it even now, because there was really, truly equal work for an equal pay. Women got exactly the same amount of money as we did. Was there some problems with that at first, though? Yeah, at first, of course, there were, were, uh, there were problems in both ways. There were problems of people saying, oh, these people, these women, they can never do this. And there were also problems that said, uh, well, we want to be sexist about this and pinch them and persecute them what we now call it sexually assault them, which was really just oogled them. But it, it didn't last very long. No, they, uh, once, once you got used to uh, uh, women in the shipyard, that, uh, they were just shipbuilders. You said America at its best. The war, World War II, was, was fought at home and was won at home as well by the people who worked in, in places yeah. such as the shipyard. Um, what, what do you see that we don't have today, that we had in that time in our history? Well, one thing is, was our purpose. 
They had, we, we, we knew what we were doing here was important to get the armament, the troops of, across the, the oceans to where they were needed. And another thing was a great deal of optimism. It was strange because I felt the same way. I was myself at the low point of my life. I had just lost my country through Hitler and came, and my future was extremely uncertain. And here was the whole United States after Pearl Harbor. There was a thing of a parallel. We were both at very low points. And there was a tremendous feeling that everything will come out right and everything will be done right. And uh, uh, there is much more of a pessimism now or a, or, a, or a skepticism or a nihilism. We knew exactly what we were doing. And also, I think, as far as working is concerned, there was, uh, we in the shipyard knew exactly what, what we were doing because I did something which was really meaningless, uh, always the same snapping of lines or hammering something uh -huh. into place. But then we saw that what we did we saw actually the crane picking it up and putting it into and place. That it had and meeting. and it, it was part of a ship. Well, it's a wonderful story. The optimism does shine through. It shows a very important time in our history. The book is Swing Shift, the author, Dr. Joe Fabry, and we're very glad you were with us today. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And we're going to take a break. We'll be back with more Good Morning California in the Soap Spot with Da from Ryan's Hope right after this. Fighting a global war calls on its shipbuilders for vessels of every type and description. And here is one of the miracle men of United States shipbuilding, Henry J. Kaiser. With an 81-piece model of the famous Liberty ship, Mr. Kaiser shows how the 10,000-ton vessels are actually constructed. Each part is prefabricated, built at a different plant, and assembled just as the master shipbuilder has done here. The actual time to build the shipyard was phenomenally short. It was the spring of 1941, and by September of that same year, we laid the first keel. And by December of that year, 1941, the first ship was launched out of shipyard number two. Kaiser's plan depended on a massive industrial plant and thousands of new shipbuilders. They would form specialized teams constructing the Liberty ships using giant prefabricated sections. A giant workforce had to be recruited from all over the United States, even from overseas. I was a recent immigrant from Austria, from Vienna, where I was born. I had to leave because of the uh, uh, Jewish persecution. I came out by myself, left my two sons with my mother in Birmingham. I was a doctor of law and a, a writer of German stories, and neither of these were of any use here. There wasn't time to train workers in traditional shipbuilding. Like this. Any questions? First of all, I had to go to night school to learn about pipes and pipe fittings and so forth, because all I knew was that you turned the faucet and the water flowed. I went to the hiring hall. At that time, the only jobs they had open was welders. So I signed up to be a welder. We went to the hall on Wednesday, and we went to work on Monday. But that was not much to our credit, because if you could breathe, they found something you could do. Now let's take a look at the LST's design and construction. First, we'll the take leader man and the foreman were puzzled about the blueprint. And they cursed and they and swore. Eventually, as I said very timidly, I, I think this piece goes on the other side of the, of the plate. So the, everybody turned around me and said, can you read, read the blueprint? said, yes, I learned it in high school. And then everybody turned to me and said, no, what does this mean? What does this mean? Here, for the first time, I was somebody, and that was useful. Very quickly, the new workers were trained in specific skills that could be done repeatedly. The 
prefab assembly line system worked, and as the workers became more and more efficient at their jobs, construction time shortened. The first Liberty ship took 197 days to build. By April of 1942, it was down to 86 days. In May, 74 days. In October, 11 days. This was a world record. Everyone took great note of it. The men in Richmond, as well as the supervision and the management, said, we think we can do better than that. 30,000 proud and weary shipbuilders watched Mrs. James F. Burns, Sisson, Robert E. Peary. I was in that fantastic experiment to build a 10,000-ton ship in four and a half days. In four days, 15 hours, 27 minutes uh, to launching and outfitted it in another three days that all of us took tremendous pride in that accomplishment. Yes, there was a great deal of pressure. That was the, the whole point, was to get it on down where it was needed as quickly as possible. You had to be friends with the crane operator to get him to, uh, to get to you and let somebody else wait. Well, my grandmother always taught me you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. So that was my system. I made friends with them. And uh, I, I found a little sweet talk would go a long way towards getting things done. Well, it just seemed like it was a big family. It was, it was just a big, big family. White and black, I, you know, you never see anything like it. Well, Joe was my partner. He was a little Filipino. Filipino fella, and he was, he was a, he was a gentleman. He was a fine young fella, and he was wasn't an inch over, uh, four and a half feet tall, and I was six feet one and a half, and he was my partner, and we did a beautiful job uh, of painting. See, I never had to get down low, and he never had to reach up too high. It just worked real good, it worked beautiful. Yeah, Joe. His name was Joe. He was, he was some kind of fellow. There was a very cooperative spirit, generally, among the workers, because everyone knew that the output of this particular shipyard was very important to our country and to the war effort. By the war's end, the men and women of the Richmond shipyards had built 2,751 merchant ships. Their miracle of production beat the enemy threat. Our massive new merchant fleet gave the Allies an unbroken bridge of ships across the Atlantic. The shipyard for me had a special meaning because as a refugee from the Nazis, I, I saw an opportunity to do something for the war effort, which for me was almost more important than life and death. I think I learned more in the shipyard than I learned in the university in Vienna. How to live, how to live fully, how to live purposefully. Uh, I couldn't say I, I, it was a happy time, but it was a fulfilled time. 